So I'm Melanie Jukes, as Shauna said, I've been teaching principles of home canning for about 15 years. And I'm excited today to teach you. I'd love to see drop in chat. I'm curious if you guys are beginners or um, have canned before or have canned lots all the time. Usually we have a good range of people here, but if you'll just drop in chat, I'd like to know about who the, the average um, canner is here. So, uh, okay, I can see some of those coming in. And actually, I, I'm guessing that most of you won't be able to see the whole chat, but you can pop it in chat too. I'll be able to see that. Uh, so we're going to talk today about the basics of home canning, how it works, why it's important to know. I do want to say that canning is not the only food preservation method, and we preserve food for lots of reasons. Sometimes it's for, you know, we're gardening and we just have an excess, so we want to keep it for longer. Sometimes we love the taste of preserved food better than maybe we can buy it. Sometimes it's because we can't buy things out of season, and that's another way to store it. So there's lots and lots of reasons to preserve food, but it all boils down to we're trying to extend the shelf life of that food and uh, avoid the waste of it. So we're going to talk about the methods of preserving just briefly today, food safety, and that, what that means when it comes to canning where to go for reliable recipes, what the different canning methods are, why we need to add acid to tomatoes, altitude adjustments, what not to can, what can be safely adjusted in recipes, and then of course, the storing of that food. So I'm seeing most of you are beginners, never can before, um, have done a little bit, most are beginning. Okay, I'm seeing that. that's great. So we're just gonna focus on canning specifically today, but I, I want to draw attention that it's not the only method of preserving. Um, it might be the pickiest in many ways, and I'll tell you why, but of course there's drying and freezing and fermenting and um, irradiation, drying of spices, jams and jellies and um, pickling, of course, well, those are also methods of canning, but not necessarily. You can make a freezer jam or a refrigerator jam, for example, and that's another way to preserve. We're going to focus today on canning specifically, but our website, canning.usu.edu, has information about all these things, including freeze drying. And we are currently teaching some canning classes. We've got two more actually next Tuesday evening is one on jams and jellies and fruit specifically. And then the first Tuesday in May, we're going to do one on um, freeze drying. So if you are interested in learning more about freeze drying, um, that's available. So let's get into canning. But first, let's talk about food safety. So if I'm out here grilling some hamburgers today and maybe we're all feeling hungry, it's just about lunchtime or just thereafter, if I had these hamburgers for you and I was going to give one to you, but I couldn't guarantee that this meat had been cooked all the way through, um, how many of you would want one? And most of you would probably be like, oh, well, maybe I wouldn't want one. Um, why? Why would you not want one? And I'd love to actually see some answers if you want to put that in. Um, why would you not want to eat? a hamburger that maybe isn't cooked all the way. Now, some of you probably are like, I don't want to get sick. Some of you are like, I don't like the taste of raw meat. Some of you are like, I've been sick before. Bacteria, oh, great. We got an answer. Zoe just said it right to the point. So bacteria, so she is aware that bacteria can be on raw meat and could make us sick if we eat it. Now, how do we know that? Well, so, well, some of us know from experience, right? Maybe trial and error over time, but a science has now shown us that there's actually a lot of different types of bacteria and virus and parasites that can be on food. And if it's not cooked, uh, prepared or stored correctly or with the best hygiene, then it can make us sick. Um, and that's why we don't wanna eat a raw hamburger necessarily. So. There are food, four steps to food safety in general, For and we're hoping people in restaurants are following these. We're hoping you follow them at home, washing your hands and cleaning your area of food preparation, separating your raw meats from your fresh vegetables, cooking to adequate temperatures, and then chilling in the adequate time so it's not left out into the danger zone. So this is all information we often learn in school when we're studying food safety, or if you're taking a food handler's permit, some of these same things apply to canning, and here's why. So there is 
a risk of foodborne illness anytime we have food. And we want to reduce that risk of foodborne illness in canning. So there's this handout from Northwestern Medicine, food, foodborne illnesses in just a few bites. So one in six Americans experience food poisoning every year. And we know that through nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and fever and all those nasty things. So on this, you know, if you look around here, you can see there's Campylobacter bacteria is a type of microbe. E. coli, that's the one we usually know about. That's a bacteria that can be on ground meat. Um, Listeria salmonella, some of these probably sound familiar. What I want to point out here is that they're all from different sources. So you can see here in the E. coli, it's from undercooked ground beef, for example, and it can also be from unpasteurized milk and juice and stuff. Listeria is often unpasteurized dairy products, even some raw fruits and vegetables. Uh, salmonella, eggs is one of the most common culprits there. So I'm bringing this up to show that there's a lot of different types of bacteria and the way we prepare for them or are prepared to get rid of them is different. Um, for example, you've probably seen something similar. This is from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The, is it done yet? It talks about the, the temperature that you should cook food to reduce the risk of E. coli, of salmonella, of those different microbes that can make us sick. So in that middle section here, 160 degrees is what you should heat um, ground meat to in order to destroy any E. coli that might have been present on it. So this principle is holding true for canning. There are certain temperatures. So, you know, we're not gonna go in depth, but how come, for example, a full steak is only 145, but a hamburger is 160. And there's a different, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, but the science has shown that that's when, if you heat it to those temperatures, you're reducing your risk of those bacteria. So it's the same thing with canning. It's not just simply cooking, but it's a scientific process that we want to make sure we are destroying microbes that could make us sick or destroy our food and kind of waste that time that we're spending preparing. The biggest thing we're worried about in canning is called botulism. This is created from a microbe called Clostridium botulinum, which actually exists all around the world in soils. And if we eat it by like, if it came on a carrot and we pick a carrot out of the ground and kind of wipe it off and ate it, not a big deal because as it's little bacterium, it's not dangerous to us. When it becomes dangerous is when it is perfectly incubated. And um, as it multiplies, it produces a byproduct, the toxin botulism. So that's when it becomes dangerous. So this little incubation period that's perfect for Clostridium botulinum is inside a can of food that is low acid and um, left at room temperature, which is what we do with our cans of food and an airtight environment. Most other bacterias and viruses, they thrive on air. Air helps them to grow and multiply and replenish themselves. But oddly enough, Clostridium botulinum, it, it it's only when it's in this airtight, low acid environment that it's like, hello, I'm waking up and I'm going to make some toxins. But we can prevent botulism just like we can prevent or at least reduce the risk of E. coli on a hamburger by heating up to 160 degrees. We can do that by following safe canning guidelines that have already been tested to ensure the thermal processing is hot enough for long enough to destroy bacteria such as Clostridium botulinum. The interesting thing about Clostridium botulinum too is boiling water temperatures doesn't destroy it. No matter how long you put that thing in boiling water, boiling water isn't hot enough to destroy it. So that's another reason why we're concerned about canning. Botulism is not something any of us want. We can get um, like paralysis. Um, it's often noticed by like a thick slurred speech and um, like problems with your cognition. Um, those are things that you should always go to an emergency room for, but it, it can be deadly. We did have a woman of about three or four, I guess it's been four years now in Utah who improperly canned green beans and got botulism and luckily survived, but she was in the ICU for a long time, a couple months, not a, not a fun circumstance by any means. 
It's rare, but it's possible. And we want to make sure that as you're canning, you know the steps to prevent it. So if you're ever in doubt about a product that you're about to consume or that you made and you're not sure if it's been stored properly or if it became unsealed, we always suggest throwing it out. Unfortunately, botulism, you can't smell it, taste it, or see it. It's not a type of um, like mold or stinky thing that's going to show itself. So that's unfortunate. So we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts of canning so that you can stay away from getting botulism. So the first thing is to make sure you're going to these safe scientific recipes and procedures to begin with. A simple Google search for, you know, how to can meat may or may not pull up the proper methods. So you want to make sure that um, going to the right sources. So let me show you what these sources are. So the first one I would recommend is the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning. This is actually a free ebook. Um, and you, I'll show you the next website where you go to it. Um, so it's available free online. We do have some in most extension offices in the state, or we will be. We're making an order right now to getting them. But if you're in the Salt Lake area, I have some in my office you could buy if you wanted a hard copy. But you could save it to your computer, save it to a tablet or just access it via the website. This goes through these little sections here. So there's the principles of home canning, which is some of what I'm gonna talk about today. And some of the images you'll see come from that section. I would recommend reading that, even if you can before and feel like you're pretty comfortable with the process, I would spend a few minutes just reading those pages. And then it has sections on canning fruits and fruit products like jams and pie filling, tomatoes and tomato products like salsas and sauces vegetables and vegetable products, fermenting and pickling, jams and jellies, as I already, and poultry meats and seafood. Yes, actually. So that is a great resource to use. It can be found at this website. It's a National Center for Home Food Preservation. And in the note I stuck in chat that you can download and save to your computer, the handout, there's a link to it, but it's just homefoodpreservation.com. I'll stick that in chat right now. Home food preservation. Dot com. I think I spelled that wrong. Reservation. No, I think that's right. Um, and this, this you can, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the website, there's a part of the bottom right in a tiny little box that says publications. And if you click there, you'll be able to access the USDA canning guide. But you can also just click directly on like this can or the freeze or the dry or, you know, cur curing if you're looking for curing or fermenting and, and then click on the list of things they have there. The same, like if I click on how do I can tomatoes, it's the same information that's on the USDA canning guide. It's just on the website form. So this is where when I get canning calls and people call me and I don't know something right off the top of my head, this is where I go. I just log to this website. I click on the canning topic they're asking about and, and usually find the answer right there. So it's a, a great website. The next place I would recommend is our own website through Utah State University. We are obligated through the USDA to do what I'm doing today is to teach you safe canning. And our website is just canning.usu.edu. We have information on um, canning and freezing and food storage. And um, you can click by common foods that are grown in Utah to see how to preserve them. Um, there's information on how to use a pressure canner in there, um, why you shouldn't use an electric pressure cooker to can, um, all sorts of things like that on our website. So you could bookmark that, go to it often, um, where we try to keep it updated and have that there. Yeah, I am I'm getting a question to put the handout in the chat again. So I'm going to plop that right there. Um, so you have to look in the chat box that's down by your mute and unmute button or your camera. Well, I guess you're in webinar form, but it should be the bottom of your screen. And then you'll just have to save it to your computer to access it. And if you're not able to get that, you can email me and my email will be on the last slide or it will be on the, the website after this program. Okay, so US, USU's extensions website. Okay, the next, the next, another great place is a book called So Easy to Preserve. You want the sixth edition. Um, and there's also a DVD with, with people just showing you step-by-step -step how to can many things. This is put out by the University of Georgia, which also houses the National Center for Home Food Preservation. This is a great book that has canning, um, dehydrating, and freezing things as well. Um, I wouldn't go to Amazon for it. 
I, I, I think people are just, because it's not really on there, they have, you could Google so easy to preserve University of Georgia and you can find the website if you wanted to buy it. Um, we usually get this out in our master food preserver class when, it, um, which is like eight hour days of lecture of why and how, and then actual hands-on stuff. It's a great book. Um, just make sure you're looking for the sixth edition. Another place is the Ball Canning Company. And they, you know, they have um, food scientists and um, chefs and microbiologists who are on staff to test and try things out. They've got a bunch of different uh, publications, such as the one on the left is the Ball Blue Book. It's no longer like a blue cover. This is the most updated one. I think it's like the 37th edition. But they've also got like magazines and um, this book right here on the left, this Ball Book of Canning. It's got like a picture and one recipe on a spread. So there's not as many recipes in there as like the a, a traditional ball book, um, but they, they've got a lot of great stuff to use too. I did notice, however, a few years ago, a, a random kind of reminded me of like a home and garden magazine that was on canning. It was not sponsored by ball and there were errors inside of it. I flipped through it and bought it and actually noticed they didn't tell you to adjust altitude. They, anyway, there were things I noticed that I was like, ah, so do be careful the types of books you're looking for. And be careful with that. Another one is the Ball Canning website. They do have a recipe section. You can see discover new recipes. They've got a great like pectin calculator. If you're, um, you know, you've got this much pectin and you want to make strawberry jam, but you don't have the recipe for it or, ever, or anything like that. That's a, a great website too. And not everything in their books is on their website and vice versa. So if you're looking for something particular, you might be able to find it there. So that's a great resource. And then any like commercial pectin package or like the pickling and salsa mixes should have a procedure on there that is should be safe to follow if they are mentioning altitude. And we'll talk about why that's important. So the next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the methods and equipment. What do you need? How do you actually can? So to start, you're going to need jars that are meant for canning at home. So I wouldn't reuse um, old pickle jars, other like old mayonnaise jars, other things like that. Buy like the ball or mason jars, the curd jars that are meant and tempered for home canning. If you're buying some from like a thrift store or, um, you know, secondhand by any means, just check for cracks. Um, I have had, I accidentally had an old mason jar, like in a collection that I brought from my mom's house once. And as I pulled it out of the canner, it, the bottom had totally broken off and I just had this mess of stuff in the canner. So you do want to make sure you have the right tempered canning jars. And we do recommend two piece lids and screw bands. You can buy one piece lids, but I even looked at the ball package the other day and it says not for canning. It's for decor and dried foods only. Um, there are other brands that are one piece, but there, you know, a commercial process of people who are like making jam to sell it or even companies that are making things like that, it's different than at home. There are some reusable lids out there on the marketplace, but studies have showed that they often come unsealed during the storage process. And maybe not often, I wouldn't say like the majority of them, but more of them come unsealed than the standard two piece, the lid with the screw band. So we do recommend that during COVID, they were way backlogged. It was really hard to get, but I feel like they're last year, they were back in stock, more easy to find. They are only recommended to use one time for canning things. So sometimes I keep the lids and I'll use it to maybe I put a dehydrated food in the jar and it doesn't need to seal. So it's okay to use it or I'm storing popcorn kernels in it or whatever, you know, that doesn't matter. But for canning purposes, it's only meant to use once that sealing compound on that rubber part is only guaranteed to work once. And so new lids every time, but these screw bands you can reuse over and over again. We recommend getting rid of the ones that are dented and rusted, but otherwise that's what you need are jars, lids and rings. If you're buying brand new jars, they come with lids and screw bands. Um, if you're using jars, you can just buy new lids each time. What you also need are certain canning tools. So I'll just walk you through this on the far, far left. That's a jar lifter. You definitely want some sort of jar lifter because obviously they're really hot as you're going to pull them out of the, the pressure canner or the boiling water. And um, you don't want to tip the jars because sometimes they don't seal as they're in there and they seal as they're sitting. So you don't want to like tip the jar out of the canner 
by using maybe a silicone glove or something. So a jar lifter is really quite important to have. Um, this green wand thing you see at the bottom, this, this particular one has two purposes. You can see the stair steps at the bottom. This is a measurer, a measuring tool for the head space, which is the empty space at the top of the jar. And to enable a a seal of the best ability for something to feel, you want to follow the proper protocol on that. So jams and jellies, for example, are only a quarter inch, but meats are an inch and a half. So that tool can help you to know like how much liquid do I need to fill all the way to the top. A funnel is, I mean, you could probably do it without a funnel, but it just helps save your food so you're not making as many spills. Um, it really comes in handy when you're doing liquid. Um, anything liquid. Now this green basket, this was just an image. This represents a rack. So you could use this from the ball canning company if you're doing a small batch. It only fits three pint jars. Um, but if you're doing small batch canning, you just want to do maybe one tiny salsa recipe or one tiny jam recipe. This basket is really great to use. But whatever kind of canner you use, you have to, you got to have some sort of barrier between the glass and the bottom of the canner to prevent the jars from breaking. Um, and we'll talk about the actual canners in just a second. So why we have two different canners is this reason. So food acidity is what determines if I'm using a just boiling water or if I need to use a pressure canner that's steam under pressure or that is, um, yeah, it's steam under pressure, which gets a higher temperature. So in this little cartoon thing, we see a, uh, a pH chart. So, you know, something like milk, is a higher number pH, but a lower acid. And something like a lemon is a higher acid with a lower pH. Did I say that right? Lower pH is a high acid. High pH is a low acid. I apologize if I said that wrong the first time. So acid is a protector from a lot of microbes that can destroy food, including Clostridium botulinum that causes botulism. So the nice thing about having a product that has acid is that the acid protects it. And so all you got to worry about killing are all the other microbes that could, call, that could cause yeast and molds and the food to deteriorate faster. And those types of microbes just take a boiling water temperature for a certain amount of time, depending on the thickness of the food. Um, and basically that, <laughs> and it's acid level. Um, so it, the cutoff here is 4.6. That's where the boiling water, or the, sorry, that's where the pH level, where the acid is too low and the pH is too high to protect against Clostridium botulinum. And so, like I've mentioned before, no matter, and these aren't exact, there's a tomato kind of hovering there. Um, tomatoes are a little bit higher than that. Actually, they hover around the 4 to 4.6. Um, but something like beans or peas, for example, they don't have acid. And that means that Clostridium botulinum can find a happy place there and incubate and create toxins. And no matter how long we can peas in boiling water, it will never get hot enough to destroy Clostridium botulinum if that happens to exist on the food as it gets put into the canner. So that's why we need to use a pressure canner, which with the pressure and steam, it gets hotter than boiling water. So with that in mind, depending on the type of food you are canning, you will need uh, um, either a boiling water canner like this speckled black one in the background. Um, and that has to fill all the way with water to cover your jars with uh, one to two inches of water the entire processing time. And by processing time, that's like the cooking time in that water once your jars are packed and sealed or not sealed, but closed. Um, you can also, oh, sorry, I forgot this image was here. So here's an example of like the inside of this canner. So you'll have some sort of rack or little shelf that goes at the bottom of the canner. This one happens to be like a basket and you can hold those handles and pick it up and put it down into the canner. So back in this background, you can see a rack on the bottom, the jars on top, and it's covered by one to two inches of water the entire time that it is boiling. Um, in this picture, they're using just a pot. And that's totally fine to use too. 
you can also use that green basket I showed you as the rack inside a regular stock pot. These can be purchased at most stores or online where you can buy canning supplies. They're probably 10 to $15 for a few jars and the basket. Again, that comes in really handy just with small batch canning and is a lot cheaper than buying a big canner. You can also buy something like this electric water bath canner from the ball canning company. It's called a Fresh Tech. Um, what's nice about this is it takes the heat off your stove. It has a, when you turn this little dial all the way over to canning, it just maintains a nice rolling boil where sometimes when you're on the stove top, you gotta constantly watch that. The stoves tend to kind of come on and off if, if you don't have a gas stove. And so you gotta keep watching that boil the whole time. So this is really nice to have, but it adds a price. It's definitely more expensive than those little speckly um, uh, boiling water canners. So those are your options with boiling water canners. You can use a pot with some sort of basket or rack. Um, you could even use a pressure canner, just don't seal the lid. You know, it's just a pot of water basically, or you can get this traditional, you know, the black or blue speckled ones that are still available in the stores or secondhand. Okay, pressure canning, let's talk about that next. Whoops, sorry, uh, it just said pressure canning, so you didn't miss anything. So pressure canning, because we need steam under pressure because that gets hotter than boiling water, you actually just need a little bit of water at the bottom. Depending on the size of your canner, it ends up being about two, three inches of water maybe. Um, I pressure can the other day and I needed three quarts of water at the bottom of mine, but it ended up looking about like this. Again, you need some sort of rack or shelf that your jars can sit on. And then pressure canners, you can get one that's a dial gauge like this one with the little red dial or a weighted gauge. And you might have one that looks like this as a coin and you can flip it on its side to determine if you want five pounds of pressure, 10 or 15, or maybe your weight might look like this. Um, and the weight, so they have different sizes depending on the pressure. Um, anything over a thousand feet of sea level will need a 15 pound weight. Um, and then if you're using a dial, it just depends on your altitude and we'll talk about that next. There are different types of pressure canners, different brands, different sizes and different prices. So it's definitely something to consider, but most of them today, if you're buying secondhand, you definitely wanna make sure it has things like a rubber safety fuse and a vent lock, which will lock the lid into place so you can't open it when it's under pressure because if you, you know, it's like a bomb in there if you opened it, but with that vent lock, you can't open it under pressure. So you definitely want some of, I mean, and by new, I mean, it's been decades, but if you're secondhand shopping and you just see this, cool looking pressure canner. You just want to make sure it has those safety features built in. Okay, so I talked about um, boiling water canners and pressure canners. And some of you might say, okay, in those pictures, I did not see the way I grew up canning. Maybe you see this, maybe this atmospheric, they call it an atmospheric steam canner is what you've seen or done in the past. So Ball Canning Company, the USDA, when they've studied all of these, they didn't do three methods of canning. They just did boiling water canning for high acid foods and pressure canning for low acid foods and basically said, just choose one of those. But atmospheric steam canners are still available. They've been done traditionally for a long time. So a couple of universities did studies on them, including the University of Wisconsin. And they have determined when and how you can safely use atmospheric steam canning. It's not always. Not everything can be done in an atmospheric steam canner. The biggest concern is that the water disappears and then you end up just kind of like stovetop cooking the food, um, which isn't as adequate. But most jams and jellies, juice and fruits can safely be done in an atmospheric steam canner. Where it gets tricky for us at our altitudes in Utah is that um, after 45 minutes in all their studies, the water ran out. And there are some things you have to do for longer than 45 minutes in Utah, like some types of tomatoes. So not everything can be done safely in the atmospheric steam canner and only high acid foods. So in the handout I provided for you, 
if you are familiar with this way and you want to keep doing it, and I'll, I mean, there's some things you legitimately would want to do in this. For example, if you, the only thing you can can in like half gallon jars is juice, like grape juice or apple juice. And the only way you could do that because boiling water canners aren't tall enough is to have an atmospheric steam canner that's tall enough. So there are some legitimate uses that make sense if you're trying to do certain things like that. Um, but if you're brand new to canning, I probably wouldn't suggest this. I'd probably suggest sticking with the boiling water canning and the pressure canning because those two methods will cover everything that you can can. Hope that made sense. I'm happy to take questions about that if it makes sense. But again, the atmospheric, atmospheric steam canning can be safe as long as it's high acid foods only that will never go more than 45 minutes. And then you need to make sure you're not boiling out that water as well. So it's not too high of a boil. So let's talk about acidifying tomatoes. When I showed you that chart of the food acidity, it was a rough chart. I mean, it was just graphically cute. It wasn't exactly in line to the pictures of the food. But tomatoes aren't acidic enough. Um, they border on that line of what, how much acid will prevent botulism and, you know, too low of acid that won't prevent botulism. And that's because over time and decades and decades, tomatoes have been bred to be less acidic. And that's even true to heirloom tomatoes. We had some professors with USU Extension do some studies where they measured the pH of a variety of tomatoes at a variety of ripeness. And the acid does vary quite a bit, especially when they are overripe or, or like picked and left on the counter for a little bit. So to be safe, the USDA in the late 1990s said, okay, we need to add acid to all tomatoes to make them safe to can because they are too close to that border of um, too low of acid, which means botulism could grow. So to do this, it's really fairly simple and you don't have to memorize this. You're welcome to take a picture of the slide if you can often and maybe didn't know this, but when you look at the canning procedures for how to can tomatoes, it will be in there. It will say acidified tomatoes according to this. So basically what you do is you take bottled lemon juice. You're going to want like not the cute little lemon size one from the um, produce section, but you want like the bottled lemon juice down the juice aisle that's been certified to be 5% acidic, the whole thing, because obviously acid of all things can vary depending on their ripeness and things like that. So the bottled lemon juice, you could use lime juice too if you want, as long as it's the bottled. Needs um, Two tablespoons need to be put directly into each quart jar of tomatoes that you're canning or one tablespoon into pint jars you're canning. You can also use citric acid and that would be a half a teaspoon of citric acid or a fourth a teaspoon for pint jars. Um, you could use vinegar as long as it's 5% acidic, but it's like five to six tablespoons per quart jar. It's a lot. You're going to taste that more. So the recommendation for best taste would be lemon or citric acid. And some people may, might think, ah, I don't want that flavor to ruin my food. Do the citric acid then if you're concerned about that. But I found that lemon actually just kind of enhances um, you know, they're in cooking, sometimes you just need a little acid to something to just give it a flavor. And so I found, you know, if I'm using my tomatoes for a soup or a marinara sauce, I don't notice any difference and it works just fine. But again, that's to increase the acid level of your canned product to prevent it from receiving the toxins associated with botulism or yeah, with botulism. So I hinted at this earlier, we got to adjust our canning procedures for altitude. And the reason that is, is because as, as you increase in, in altitude or elevation from sea level, the temperature of boiling water decreases. So boiling water might be about 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, but where I am in Salt Lake County, it might be only 206 degrees. So we have to add some time to compensate for that. So again, you're not guessing on this. You're just looking in the canning procedures for what they say. The USDA canning guide will show you under the procedures. It will just give you a chart with processing time saying at this altitude for this size of jar, this is how long you cook and process that food. But in something like the ball canning book, you have to go like page three. It's like those introduction pages and it will have a chart for you that says to add. So it's usually for, for elevation of four to 6,000, it's usually adding 10 minutes 
but you want to just double check that against the procedures and see what that is. I see a question about acidifying tomatoes. Um, does it apply to just water bath canning or do we also need to acidify tomatoes with pressure canned? Yes, you do need to do it for pressure canned as well because the testing procedures on pressure canning, they're not as high of, of altitude, or sorry, they haven't, it's not as high of pressure. Um, and I will, let, give me just a second and I'll pull that up and show you an example of what that means. But sometimes for the pressure canning, of tomatoes, it's a it's a lower pressure. It might only be eight pounds, and that's not the 240 degrees you need to kill Clostridium botulinum. Um, and if you did any hotter, your tomato products won't turn out so great. So um, in this instant, we get asked this all the time. Well, can't I just increase the pressure to prevent against botulism? Well, yeah, in theory you can, but how do you know how long to process it? There's not a chart on that. There's not um, a guessing mechanism. There's not a tool to test that at home. So you're just you're just guessing. And again, we don't want to guess in canning. We want to follow the safe procedures that have been already tested for us that we know will reduce our risk of that. Let's chat about what not to can. So as I've as I've read and and met some people who are testing recipes, you find out what it takes. So they're in labs, and each of the food products in there have these microbes that are testing for the the temperature of it all throughout. So they're not actually like sprinkling botulism in there and then seeing if it disappears, but they're doing the thermal testing. And um, I've heard chefs from the ball canning company say that they have thrown out recipes that they can't get to work out well after, you know, or, you know, they, in order to make it work, they have to heat it so high and the product is nasty. So they throw the recipe out or, you know, things like that. So, and it could also be the case that there are just, nobody has tested it yet. So we don't know. And I'm going to show you a variety of those that we, uh, in some instances, we just don't know. And so we don't recommend it. For example, canned butter. So you can actually buy canned butter. It's really rare. I see it often in um, like emergency preparedness kind of stores. It's like a tuna can size, but there is not a safe way to do butter at home in a jar. And why is that? Well, first of all, most of the recipes that people come to me with, they're boiling water canning it, which we know it's a low acid food and it would have to be pressure canned. Um, so that's that's one thing. The high heat, we're not sure, would really make a good quality butter after that to begin with, you know, at 240 degrees for a really long time, um, just might not make a good product. So we do not recommend canning butter. And we do recommend if you're trying to kind of store, quote unquote, long term, it would be to freeze it. Obviously, freezing has a shelf life, too. It definitely extends the life of food, but it's not going to make it last forever. So please don't can butter and please don't pass those recipes around until we know or until somebody wants to invest a lot of money in testing it. Hydrated wheat kernels. So most of the time when we eat wheat, we're grinding it into flour, but you can obviously cook it up like a grain, um, like a barley or like a rice, and it can be in soups or salads or um, meatloaf, all sorts of things. So it, it takes longer to cook than rice does. And so people are like, well, if I cook it and then, um, or pressure can it, it cooks while it's pressure canning, and then I have a jar ready to go to put into my soup. But we do know that starchy things, um, it messes with the thermal processing because it makes it thicker and, and maybe not as good of quality. So at this point, it's never really been tested. And we do not recommend because we know it is a low acid and we don't know how long you'd have to pressure can it in order to kill any of that Clostridium botulinum that's on there. So that is not safe to do at this point. It's unknown. Quick bread. I think how this started, I haven't had a lot of questions on it lately, but things kind of come in cycles. Um, I think where this started is there are recipes to actually take your banana bread or whatever and cook it in a coffee can, an empty coffee can in the oven. And then, you know, you can, when it's done, you, you empty it out and it's a round loaf and just kind of a cutesy way to make quick bread. Um, and I think somebody was like, oh, I can use a wide, a wide mouth jar and cook it that way. And then somebody probably one of these days was like, oh, I'll just put a lid on it and put it on my shelf. But we do know a few things about quick bread. It gets thicker as it cooks. Um, 
which the thickness definitely interferes with the heat penetration of the pressure canners. We also know it's low acid. Um, so at this point, please don't can quick bread. Again, you could freeze it if you're hoping for a little bit of a longer storage, or you could you know, freeze the bananas, for example, or the zucchinis and then make it fresh. Dry beans, this is another one that is often misunderstood. There are recipes for pressure canning dry beans, but as you read the instructions, it will tell you you need to soak the beans first and then partially cook them first. And, and that's important for the heat penetration, the thermal processing and that kind of thing. So can you can dry beans? Yes, but in the processing, they can't be dry when they go in your jar. So that's a trick. I've heard people pass that around. They're like, oh, it's so easy. I put dry beans in there, fill it with liquid, stick it in my pressure canyon, but you are missing a lot of steps and that heat isn't able to get through all the way if you do that. So follow the procedures very carefully in, in that regard. Let's talk about a few things that you can adjust and then I'll have time to show you um, an example of that tomato acid on the USDA canning guide. So customizing recipes. So these are the things that won't interfere with the safety or the acid or the heat penetration. Um, salt levels. Salt is, while we sometimes think that salt is a preservative, when it comes to canning, it's not. It's just for flavor. So you can omit them if that's something you need to do for your diet or your personal taste preferences, or you could even add more if you wanted. And that, that doesn't matter. Salt is um, something you can adjust except in pickles. When you're actually trying to pickling, pickle, pickling, because um, the salt does help with the crispness of the vegetables. And so you, you know, if you're trying to get a crisp pickle without salt, it won't happen. Um, I see a, uh, a question, can you safely can ghee? No, there are no safe recipes for canning ghee. So again, that would not be a, a, a recommended method of canning, home canning, but you could preserve that in your fridge or freezer. Um, Sugar in, in fruit can be adjusted. And literally you could can fruit in water if you wanted. However, sugar does aid in keeping the food product a nice firm and plumpness. So think of a peach, for example. If you use a heavy, heavy syrup, it keeps that peach nice and firm. But you can reduce the, the sugar levels in the syrup. The syrup is just sugar and water mixture. And so there's a high high heavy syrup, a medium one, and a light. So you can adjust that, or you can use things like 100% um, fruit juice, like apple juice or pineapple juice or pear juice. Um, or you could safely can most fruits. I think there's a couple of different pears that have too low of a pH, um, but other, other fruits could be safely canned in water. And we will demonstrate this and we'll have our groups in our master food preserver classes try things like um, pineapple and apples in water, and then you kind of taste and see afterwards. But while it's safe, the sugar does help with the sweetness and the firmness of the fruit, but that's something you could adjust. There are some recipes for things like um, sugar substitutes, but generally those are better to add later. Like if you wanted to add Splenda, for example, to a canned fruit, um, the high heat can kind of give that Splenda funky aftertaste. So um, usually more preferred to do it in something like a fruit juice instead of using a sugar substitute, but there are some safe recipes through ball for that. You can also add extra vinegar or extra lemon juice or citric acid. I have a friend that always puts citric acid into her peaches to keep them a nice, pretty peachish, pinky color. And um, that's totally safe um, because it's adding acid. However, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to add extra acid so that I don't have to pressure can because you're playing with science there and you can't just guess. So um, you can't use it as an excuse to maybe skip pressure canning um, unless that's what the recipe calls for. You can decrease vegetables in salsa. Now, fruit uh, tomatoes are technically a fruit, so don't mess with that one because of the recipes in a salsa, the tomatoes are usually the most acidic next to the vinegar or lemon juice. So don't adjust the tomatoes, but you could reduce the onions or reduce the peppers, or maybe, you know, you're chopping up and you're just short a half a cup of something like a vegetable, like a uh, onion or pepper, and you could simply leave that out. 
You can also substitute peppers for each other's in salsa. So if it calls for bell pepper and you want it spicy, you could substitute instead of adding. Because if you're adding, so you, you do what the recipe calls for and you're like, ah, I'm going to add a habanero or I'm going to add a couple of jalapenos. You are adding a low acid, which is going to lower your pH. So stick with the recipe guidelines, but you could switch your peppers out for each other as long as it's the same. And same with onions, you could switch for a yellow or a white or a red, or those are our are, are taste preferences. Okay, the most frequently asked question we receive is how long do home canned products last? And it is actually a tricky question to answer. And it depends on a variety of things. The first and most important is, did you follow safe, scientifically tested recipes to begin with? If you did, the next question has to do with its storing. Did you store them at a, um, at a temperature that's going to just make them taste and last better? So, you know, under 50 to 70 degrees is ideal. So watch if you're using like a garage for storage of food that will make them have a, a less or a, a lower shelf lifetime. Um, and then the other one is if they've been compromised in a flood. If they are in a flood, it is not recommended because of the potential of the contaminated water, even just, you know, just particles getting on your board or on your jar. Um, but if all of those things are great, you use a safe recipe and you, you follow the procedures correctly, your lid sealed and stay sealed. I didn't mention that one. You want to make sure the lid is sealed. It hasn't been in a flood. And um, ideally, it's been between 50 and 70 degrees. Um, it actually has a really long, safe shelf life. The problem is that the texture changes, the color changes, and the taste could change. Um, and that is where like personal preference kind of comes in. Another factor is that the ball canning company on their lids, they only say that they're guaranteed to that once you seal your jar, that the seal's only guaranteed to work for 18 months. Um, you know, it might last. And I know, I know from personal experience, I've had jars seal and stay sealed a lot longer than that, but you just, you just risk um, that, you know, they are, they're only going to guarantee the 18 months. If you look into the ball candy book and the USDA guide, they say use within a year. And all of us at Utah laugh because in Utah, we eat grandma's 30 year old something, right? <laughs> so um, it's really just with best quality use within a year or two. And from there, your quality is just going to deteriorate. So how many of you have seen like a salsa or a jam and you're not sure if it's a salsa or a jam because it wasn't labeled and it, you know, it's discolored, it's changed, you're, you're not sure. So best quality and best practice would be that you're, you're rotating and, um, you know, you're using what you store and you're storing the types of foods that you're going to use so that you don't have to wonder like, oh, can I eat this 10 year old? eye filling that got, you know, stuck in the back of my shelf and I'm, I'm not sure if it's safe or how long is this canned meat going to last, but so best use within a year, but yes, ultimately if it's safe, it, the calories will be there like forever, but vitamins and minerals are like the first things to go. And, and obviously the taste and texture could change. Okay. That's um, what I have for you.